Hi YouTube, I'm Ali, welcome to the channel. Now, one of the reasons I started this channel was because I wanted to reconnect with those hobbies and adventures I had uh, in my youth. Um, as a child, I remember being the most creative person I could possibly be. I created amazing play worlds that my friends and myself would inhabit. My guest this week on the design exploration that I'm going through to find out where game design ideas come from, um, I think shares a similar view. Because although he's a proper grown-up, proper, um, his, the, the, the inspiration for his latest game actually comes from a much younger mind. My name is Rusty Sosha. I am the owner and uh, kind of creator of Turn Sideways Games. And how I got to this point, uh, I started playing board games in college. Um, I, I play competitive Ultimate Frisbee and started playing nice. in college. And that, that community is very much into board games. And so um, I think like a lot Who of knew? people, uh, Catan was my first board game. So. Um, you know, just got heavily into board games. There was a local shop in Pittsburgh, which is where I'm from, um, uh, that's called Phantom of the Attic. Shout out to them. They, like, were essentially the curators of, of my, my board game collection because I just walk in and say, what, what should I play next? And um, I was living with two other guys at the time that I, I kind of started diving into things, and we played just so much small world uh you know we got heavily heavily invested in that and very strategic and so um you know kind of got some other games got a terra mystica you know built out the collection went from heavy to light and kind of where everywhere in between and then got the idea that hey i i can make a game that last comment there that's why i'm doing this and i i kind of grew up making up games with my brothers i'm the oldest of, of six and uh you know we would chase each other around the, the basement or, you know, throw darts at the wall and, you know, just but, but create rule sets around it that, you know, make it interesting. Sure. Um, and, and so I uh, kind of put it all together like, oh, I've actually always enjoyed making games and this is now like a framework in which I can kind of create something. And uh, I started to make a game called My Metropolis. Um, I launched that as a Kickstarter and it failed. And the internet is um, is is brutal and you know, fortunately, there's a lot of honesty that, that kind of came through that process where people right. basically were like, your Kickstarter failed because your artwork sucks and we have no idea what your game's about. And gotcha. I was like, okay. And I, I'd come to, I felt comfortable launching the Kickstarter because my biggest concern was, um, you know, the, creating cool mechanics and then making sure that my business model actually worked. Cause I kind of, I'm like on the business side of things. I got an engineering degree and then I was working on my MBA. I was like, oh, I need to, really adjust my focus here and, and realign and get, um, you know, figure out the, the actual things to make a Kickstarter successful. So he tried a Kickstarter and it didn't work. It failed. Is that the end of the story? Well, clearly not. I'm pausing here because I want to draw back to the previous interviewee and how we had spoken, uh, John had spoken, in fact, about drawing success from failed attempts. As you shall see in a second, that's exactly what happened here too. Anyway, um, at that time, like where the Kickstarter kind of failed, my mom called me and she's like, your youngest brother, William, is working on his own board game. He is inspired by you and he, he's got a game. I said, okay, put him on the phone. And he's like, uh, I'm like, what's it called? And he's like, Taco Ninja Adventure. I'm like, Oh. Rusty went on to explain that he went and visited his uh, kid brother during Christmas and began exploring the possibility of taking the idea and building it into a fully fledged game. What I loved about his approach was at no stage did Rusty look to change the world that his kid brother had created. Instead, he was looking to develop mechanics that supported uh, that, that gameplay in that world. He wanted something that was quick, fun to play, but still gave that element of um, something new and novel. We spoke a little bit about the influences that Rusty had in developing the game. Uh, and then uh, I asked him the question around how he was able to pare down his um, his instructions, his 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 rule set to into something that would allow for that free flowing, quick play game. This is something that I learned through the process of Taco Ninja uh, Adventure, where um, you always kind of want to try to get to the minimum viable product, and then 
add on from there. So, so my biggest issue, and I, I kind of mentioned this in the Reddit post, is I create this monstrosity, and I've learned to just strip down parts and like say like this is less fun than this. It's, I'm taking it out, and you know this element is overly complex. It doesn't need to be there. And like a, a good example of it is, um, hey, why is this attack dealing three damage when it could be dealing one damage? Like, why are we operating on twos and threes? Like, wh why don't you just take it down to one? And it's, you know, putting your, always asking yourself those questions once you've created something, because um, the, 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 and I feel badly saying this, a lot of these kind of concepts came from guys in the Chicago, well, guys and girls in the Chicago area that are, you know, in this board game design community, and they're the ones that initially challenged me with my first prototypes of Taco Ninja, saying like, think about this, think about that, like, you, you want to end the game just before people want to be done with it. For me, that last sentence was another nugget of gold. What a great way of summarizing whether a game is good or not. That thought that if you had just one more round, you could have won. I love that. Anyway, back to the interview, Rusty and I began speaking about influences and the selection criteria around finding and building the right game mechanics for his game. I'm a big Magic the Gathering player and I actually that was one of the first games I looked at for my research and development for Taco Ninja. And so if you ever play Taco Ninja, it's going to feel like you're playing a little bit of Magic. Um, but uh, an example uh, that I had for Taco Ninja is there's item cards and I kind of thought that it'd be a good idea to use a similar kind of stack method where one person plays an item card and then another person plays an item card and they can kind of, you know, all their effects kind of stack up in the same way that you would, you know, casting instants and sorceries and magic. But then in play, I realized, oh, this isn't actually fun because somebody plays something. So someone deals like five damage and then someone says, okay, I'm going to play an eye for an eye where you're also taking the damage. And then someone says, okay, well, I'm going to double up the damage that's being dealt. So now you're dealing, getting dealt 15 damage. It's like, well, that's half my life. Like I'm going to play this other thing. And then it kind of like all, everyone's resources are now expended. No one has stuff to do on later turns. Um, everybody like this person's at half life. This person's, you know, pretty dead too. In this instance, the game's going to be over in five minutes, but in between now and that time, no one's really going to do anything except rolling dice. And, you know, it's the idea of the stack is, is, is cool and it works really well for magic. But in this case, it was going to be create an unbalanced game. And I just had to say, like, this isn't fun. This is cool, but it's not fun. Just take it out. Got so you. you only get to play one item card per turn now. For me, this interview has been about recognizing that great game ideas can come from anywhere, no matter what your age or background, your kid brother even. But that said, there is still a job to play as a game designer in making sure that the idea is tempered for the adult world, for the consumable world. I do have an example, though, of something that kind of came up that was a little taboo and I didn't even think about it. Uh, there, there's attack cards in this game, like uh, the, the Bean Barrage. Um, and a bunch of other ones, uh, lettuce uppercut and hurts donut. But I had, you know, I had this this uh, tier for the backers uh, at two hundred and fifty dollars. You could be a sensei and name some artwork, and then my artist would create uh, something, you know, around your name. One of the names that the backers submitted was Atomic Punch, and I was like, make some artwork. Here's what I'm thinking, and. She got back to me after a week. She's like, Rusty, I don't really know that we can do this because, um, you know, this is a Japanese game and the atomic bomb. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. You're absolutely right. We have to we have to really be sensitive to this and figure out what to do. Um, and so we ultimately landed um, with this atomic punch and it was kind of this more like a, a, a luchador with this kind of glowing fist and almost radioactive man kind of uh, vibe yeah. rather than gotcha gotcha once again we were coming to the point where i asked that that ultimate cliche question rusty if you had one thing to say to a new game designer what single piece of advice would you give them whoa um you just have to kind of get started like take the first step uh, and I think that's important for anything that you're trying to get done in life, whether it's, you know, getting in shape or anything else. You have to you have to set achievable goals for yourself and kind of do it incrementally, because if you think I'm going to start 
and you know from day zero and make a board game it, you know that launched and had a successful Kickstarter it seems very insurmountable but if you take it one step at a time and really try to enjoy the process of you know creating a prototype going out and finding some friends to play test with play testing coming back and just enjoy the process because you don't get into board games to make money wait what keep throwing money at it and in all likelihood like you're probably not going to be successful you, you do this because you enjoy the process and it it is fun to share with your friends and maybe you might make a little bit of money but you'll probably just break even and burn a lot of calories thinking about board games <laughs> Of course, I had a blast speaking with Rusty. Again, another genuinely lovely person, full of inspiration, full of great ideas. Um, and I truly, truly, I'm happy and thankful that he was able to take time out to speak to me. Of course, I'm going to link uh, as much as I can uh, below about Rusty in the description. So if you want to catch up with him on Twitter or understand a little bit more about the game or perhaps buy it, um, I'll give you uh, links, affiliate links um, down in the description. Um, next week, it's my last interview, or the next episode, rather, I should say, is my last interview uh, around game design. Uh, and then I'm probably going to take a little break before we move on to the subject of prototyping. But for now, as always, um, I want to say thank you yet again to Rusty for taking time out to speak to me. And to the rest of you guys, subscribe if you haven't, because this, uh, this is how I managed to deliver this stuff. Um, but take care, YouTube. Until next time.